I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Hey guys, I'm Max and welcome back to Retro Watch. So do you ever come across a watch and you just think there's such a good story here, I just gotta have it? Well, this happened to be about a month ago and I messaged the seller and he didn't get back to me right away. I remember that night not being able to sleep thinking about this watch. I know that makes me sound crazy. Well, this little pole router has made its way halfway across the world into my hands and I just have to say this watch, it doesn't disappoint. The pole router was introduced in 1954. At that time, Universal Genève was a major player in the watch industry. And you can think of this watch as their take on the Rolex Datejust or the Omega Seamaster. The pole router marked the first big hit for the then 23-year-old Gerald Genta, who would, of course, eventually go on to become the most famous watch designer in history. We all know Genta as being credited with the blueprint for the AP Royal Oak and the Patek Philippe Nautilus. And some may also know that he left his indelible mark on versions of the Omega Constellation as well as the IWC Ingenieur. The name Pole Router hints at the genesis of this watch as a way to commemorate the first passenger flight over the North Pole. In 1954, the Scandinavian Airline System, or SAS, officially started their polar route to fly passengers over the North Pole. This new route would cut the 36-hour trip from Copenhagen to Los Angeles to 22. However, this wasn't as simple as resetting some GPS coordinates. The strong magnetic field of the North Pole wrecked havoc on the instruments of an airplane and had similar effects on the wristwatch. Utilizing a soft iron dial, the pole router was able to shield the delicate components of its movement from magnetism. The early watches were given the name Polar Router with an A, and ones marked with SAS were given to the crews of these maiden voyages. Later, they would settle on the name Pole Router with an E, and the watch would go on a production run of a decade and a half, leaving us numerous vintage variants to choose from. These included cases made of stainless steel, gold cap, or solid 18 karat gold, as well as date and non-date versions. In initial production, the pole router used a bumper movement, which utilized an oscillating weight that bounces between two springs. 1956 saw the introduction of the micro-rotor movement, variants of which would see the watch to the end of its production life. Offshoots of the pole router line included the pole router jet, as well as the pole router sub. The reference we have here comes from the late 1950s. The dial, hands, and case are all gold or gold capped. Universal Genève is credited with the earliest micro rotor movement. This elegant design solves two issues with automatic winding, namely increased thickness and the obscuring of the movement by a large rotor. This was at one time the thinnest movement on the market at just four millimeters, and is thought to be the forefather to the Patek Philippe caliber 240. This watch has some admittedly odd dimensions. It's got a diameter of 35 millimeters, an awkward lug width of 19 millimeters, a comfortable lug to lug of 44, and an extreme thinness at what I measure to be under 10 millimeters, thanks to that micro rotor movement. The elongated lugs are twisted like those found on a Speedmaster, but more elegant. 
It's what I imagine the Omega Lugs will look like in some yoga pants. Over the six decades of its life, the dial has achieved a rich mottled patina, which offers up a golden texture underneath the applied universal insignia. The dolphin hands and the crosshair dial give the watch a certain art deco character. The hour markers are simply polished trapezoidal sections on a ribbed chapter ring. So what's the connection between this watch and Bruce Lee? It turns out this particular reference was also owned by Lee himself, who preferred to wear it on a wide leather cuff, presumably because it gave the watch more protection given the stresses it must have endured on his wrist. Before his death, Lee gifted the watch to Herb Jackson, one of his students and a close friend. We know Bruce Lee as the celebrated actor and martial artist from the 1970s. His approach to fighting was way ahead of his time. Lee believed in breaking the rigid bounds of established disciplines such as Kung Fu, Karate, or boxing because they put restrictions on what he emphasized the most, the pure expression of the human body. Having grown up idolizing the man and his philosophy, this watch holds special significance for me. Bruce Lee would go on to take what he learned from other styles and synthesize his own fighting philosophy, which he would call Ji Kun Do, or the way of the intercepting fist, and what we today would deem to be mixed martial arts, or MMA. Some called him pound for pound the strongest man to have ever lived, but don't take my word for it. Listen to the greatest fighters in the world describe him. Well, that was the most amazing thing about Bruce was the fact that he could generate so much speed and velocity in his punches, um, short punches that he used his body and his and his um, the type of leverage he was able to gain because he knew he understood the mechanics of the body. That was special. Bruce Lee's a killer. You hurt your man, you do as much damage as you can, and you get out. You know what I mean? Without being hurt, less damage on yourself as possible. You used to have so much respect for his philosophy. His philosophy is like the ultimate um, warrior philosophy. Life is like water. Fighting is like water. You have to adapt. Wow, this is deep. Bruce Lee gets me deep when I'm talking about Bruce Lee. Jackie, in your prime versus Bruce Lee, who would win? Bruce Lee. Really? Yes. No question? No question. Sadly, Bruce Lee would suffer his untimely death at the age of 32 while filming a movie he himself produced, directed, and starred in, ironically named The Game of Death, which also featured the basketball star Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. With a 35mm case and slender lugs, the watch wears much like a vintage Datejust. But compared to my Datejust, the pole router feels more daring with its interesting shapes and design elements. The watch is so thin that it feels hardly thicker than the strap it is mounted on and essentially disappears on the wrist, making it ideal if you're one to worry about tight cuffs. Though Universal Genève, like many of its contemporaries, faded into obscurity with the advent of the quartz watch, the quality of this pole router continues to shine more than a half century later. This masterfully executed timepiece with a great story behind it is a true force to be reckoned with. As you can see, the pole router remains an underrated option on the vintage market and You'd be hard pressed to find a watch with as much history for your money. So good luck finding the reference that speaks to you. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you wanna see more like it, hit that subscribe button and you also help out the channel. So thanks for watching. Until next time, be water my friends.